So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this event organised by the Leicester Area uh, Institute of Mechanical Engineers. I'm Hazel Carlin. I'm the web, web officer with the Leicester Area. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Hitesh Bogani, um, who's uh, going to speak to us about um, biological fuel cells. Um, just a brief introduction. Um, Hitesh is a senior research associate in Transport Safety Research Centre, um, currently working on the EU Horizon 2020 funded project Levitate. He has 10 years of research experience working on several national and international engineering projects. He graduated as a mechanical engineer from University of Glamorgan in 2010. Uh, he did his PhD from University of South Wales in 2014, and he's uh, undertaken several postdoc positions at the University of South Wales, Loughborough University, and the University of Birmingham. His broad range of interests are modelling and control. He's a chartered engineer and member of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, and he's also an active STEM ambassador. Um, so with that, um, and oh, um, there is a um, question facility. Um, so throughout the talk, if you want to answer, ask any questions, please type them in and we'll um, discuss them at the end of the talk. Uh, and also, if you have any technical issues with the uh, software, then write, write a question um, there in the same place as well. Thank you. Right. Um, um, thank you, Hitesh. Um, over to you. Thanks very much, Hazel. That was very generous and nice introduction. Um, and I'm very pleased to talk about my um, work that I had undertaken at University of South Wales. Um, I think you can see my photo, um, and that's how I look like if I'm shaved and properly dressed and light is shining on my face. Nevertheless, um, as Hazel mentioned, I currently work at Loughborough University. Um, so uh, um, that's where I'm based currently. So this, this work that I had undertaken as my PhD work and subsequently um, during my uh, postdoctoral research engagement at University of South Wales, I found this topic quite fascinating and interesting. And I think there are quite a lot of um, applications to um, applications of this uh, particular technology. And, and this is why I, I, I undertook the PhD. Um, so briefly to um, mention what will be, what I will be covering during this presentation is the history of this technology. Um, MXCs, where X will be replaced by something that you will see in next slide, um, next few slides, and then um, some applications of this technology, mainly electricity production, hydrogen production, biosensing, and metal recovery. And there are very many different uh, applications of this um, technology, uh, which are currently under research by many different groups. Uh, research groups across the UK as well as the world. So with that, I would like to introduce the technology. So Professor Michael Potter um, at University of uh, Durham, he experimented in 1910. Um, he took a beaker, put some solution and yeast inside that beaker with um, with few electrodes placed in, in that beaker. And then he tried to measure electrical activity. And what he found was that yeast, and, and this solution um, really produced some electricity. So he saw electrical activity that matched with the concentration of glucose that he fed. So more the glucose, so um, I think you can see in the figure, and it's quite evident that the um, concentration of glucose um, was responsible for the uh, amount of activity that he got from this, this cell. Moreover, he wondered whether the um, electrical activity came really from the 
um, the solution or the biology, uh, meaning the yeast itself. So he experimented with different um, amount of yeast um, in, in, into that beaker. So you can see that if the yeast was less um, so that, um, in case of uh, number three, Roman number three, that you can see on the slide, the electricity produced was quite less, almost negligible. So it was quite clear that yeast produced this electricity. And that's quite intriguing. We normally know that bacteria produce gas. Um, they produce some fatty acids as well sometimes. Uh, they produce all sorts of uh, different compounds. But it was not known that they can produce electricity directly, which we can harness. Over the years, lots of research had taken place. And uh, to the fact that many uh, advancements were made in the uh, materials themselves as well, we come to understanding that um, the two chambers that are um, separated by an ion exchange membrane can can be uh, can be constructed as a as a cell, uh, a fuel cell. So um, what you can see on the the, uh, the schematic here is is a complete cell, where one half of the cell, which is known as anode chamber, on the left. This is where the bacteria is, is um, residing. And these are naturally occurring bacteria. It's not something bio biologically engineered or anything like that. They are naturally occurring bacteria in another anaerobic digester and sludge that you can find um, anywhere really. So these bacteria, they decompose hydrocarbons, which have put as acetate, which is the, the, the smallest um, hydrocarbon, um, they decompose those hydrocarbons and produce electricity directly. So they, they need to get rid of those electrons they produce. So in nature, they would find some suitable uh, material or suitable another bacteria in symbiotic relationship where they basically give off electrons to someone who need them those electrons. So what we do here is we provide an electrode where they can dump their electrons onto. They can dump those electrons by several means. They, they give off electrons to some mediator in, in the solution, um, which is then uh, acting as a kind of um, um, delivery service to, to dump those electrons onto the electrode, or they can populate themselves directly on, onto electrodes. Um, there have been uh, some structures observed under microscope. They look like nanowires. Um, I think you can see those represented as the, the lowermost um, bacterium you can see on the, on the slide, which is connected by a few wires. So they, they, they can dump those electrons via those or by cytoplasm, which is basically some kind of um, external um, uh, biomaterial they, they produce on their um, cell wall. And they basically give those electrons via those. We connect those, that electrode to um, another half cell, which, is, which we call it um, cathode. And this is where hydrogen, uh, sorry, this is where the proton um, that are transferred over from the other side combine with the oxygen present in the solution. This is dissolved oxygen. And they produce um, water by, by combining it with electrons. So now this completes the circuit and we can drive a load. Um, and here you can see a light bulb as, as a load. Now, if we, if we provide extra voltage, extra potential to these electrodes, we can produce hydrogen from these cells. And this is known as microbial electrolysis cell. If we provide 
the same potential in reverse direction. So here, I think um, it might seem con confusing a little bit, but the, the one way back to EI is, um, is, is where um, we provide negative potential. And when we do that, they can produce some higher carbon, um, higher hydrocarbon, higher, fat, um, higher chain fatty acids. So this is this this is where um, uh, we we call it microbial electrosynthesis cell. If we separate these two um, chambers, so two these two half cells, and produce, uh, provide another chamber in in between, where we feed salt solution, we can use same process. To, to drive salt from, from uh, the solution in the middle um, chamber. So basically we can desalinate the water. And this is known as microbial desalination cell. And I think now you get the idea why I called it um, MXCs, where X is replaced by fuel, desalination, electrolysis, and so on. So this is family of technology evolved from this simple phenomenon of bacteria giving giving off electrons. Let's look at some prototypes. And these are basically lab scale prototypes um, showing this uh, the same process. So this is um, microbial fuel cell. Um, the one on the top left you can see is the H cell. This is simply two um, glass bottles separated by um, a proton exchange membrane. Um, it could also be an ion exchange membrane. The, the one on the top right is the flat plate reactor where the cathode is exposed to the air. So instead of using the dissolved oxygen from the, the water, we basically expose it to the the um, the air itself, and this um, re removes the need to um, uh, th this removes the need to aerate the uh, the water, um, and basically it's energy um, uh, less energy intensive process. The one on the the bottom is the tubular structure. Um, which is same as the flat plate reactor, but turned into tubular form, where the inside of the tube, we place the anode, and this is where the bacteria resides as well. And we can pump the fluid into this anode chamber and use the cathode, um, uh, the air, air cathode uh, on the outside. And this is quite, um, uh, so now in this form, it, it will be, um, quite applicable for wastewater treatment or some process where we can um, decompose the uh, bio, um, de decompose the hydrocarbons from the wastewater. So these are some practical um, uh, prototypes. So just to look at the contents briefly again, I've mentioned the history I've mentioned different variants of these um, this technology. And now let's go into the application of electricity production. And this is where this is the the, the one um, this is the application where I worked uh, more um, in, in in the past. Um, but in terms of thinking about electric, electricity production, we need to think about starting up of these, um, these fuel cells as well. Because this is biological process, we need to get them on onto the anode, populated onto the anode, which takes time. Once they, are, once they have started up, we need to basically have some practical um, voltages produced from those fuel cells so that we can use them in our, um, our applications. And then of course, we need to scale them up. Um, the lab scale um, is no good use for any industry. So in terms of looking at the startup of these fuel cells, 
because they are biological fuel cells, they are quite susceptible to the operating conditions. So one of my colleagues in that, um, in that lab, um, Ian Mickey, he looked at starting up, startup of these fuel cells um, in, in, in terms of acclimatizing to different operating conditions. So basically, because we have uh, quite very varied um, uh, environment in, in terms of temperature, it would be quite um, interest for, for us to have some resilient um, fuel cells, which, which are resilient to temperature and we don't have to control the temperature anymore. And that, that is basically the motivation for acclimat acclimatizing uh, these cells to some temperatures where they are resilient to the operating conditions. So he took three different proto prototypes. He acclimatized one to 10 degree um, C temperature, which took, which took almost a year to start up. Another one was acclimatized at 20 degree C, which took about two months to start up. And then the third one was um, operated at 35 degree C, which took about two weeks to start up. One thing I would like to mention here is that we, when we, when we start, when we have constructed the, the physical structure and we want to populate these with the bacteria, we quite simply put anaerobic digester sludge into these cell, into this anode chamber. Uh, and this basically contains the bacteria naturally, of course. So, so those bacteria, they, they prefer to go over to the anode and, and, and start dumping their electrons. And this is how we, we, we start uh, populating these bacteria. And the fact that they all come from the same sludge, there are other bacteria in the, in, in the sludge as well. Which is which which are producing methane and, and other um, gases as well. So that's quite competitive process for the for the bacteria. Um, at 10 degrees C, we can quite clearly see that there were no methane produced, and that was to do with the temperature itself because that's not favorable temperature for an anaerobic digester, whereas the other two were favorable, one less compared to the other. Um, so 35 degree, quite favor favorable compared to 20 degree C, not so favorable. Uh, still, we did see some methane. I should say he did see some methane. So then he um, operated the same acclimatized fuel cells to these three different temperatures. And we can see quite clearly the green one that was populated, um, sorry, the red one that was populated with 20 degrees C worked favorably under many different conditions. However, the other two didn't perform so well. Um, 10 degree, okay, but 35 degree C acclimated one completely, I mean, it didn't produce any um, practical voltage at um, lower temperatures. So this was quite interesting in terms of the acclimatization of these, so starting up of these fuel cells. But one thing that's quite um, inhibiting is the startup time, the time it takes them to populate over to the, to the anode. So that's where I started looking at the, um, uh, the approach to starting, you know, start them up very quickly, as quickly as they can, really. So this is where I experimented a little bit with the H cell, which are the simplest version of these fuel cells. So I supplied one of the um, setup with a poised potential. So I, I provided some potential to, to start them up, um, similar to um, starting up an engine where we provide alternate, we provide some, you know, momentum using alternator um, and then left them with 
something called maximum PowerPoint tracking, MPPT, which is basically trying to maximize the power from, from these fuel cells. As a setup, I did not provide any initial potential, but I straight away provided the maximum PowerPoint tracking. And the third setup, I simply connected it with a load, which was static. So just to briefly show what maximum PowerPoint tracking is, we basically look at the power and current, and we, we see where we are in terms of the, the, the curve. When, when, we, when we vary the current from these fuel cells, we do generate some power. And at some point, it drops off. So we, we get a, a, a bell-shaped curve. Um, that you can see on the on the slide. So if we are if we determine that we are on the left side of the curve, we simply um, adjust our load so that we move over towards the maximum point towards the maximum point. If we determine that we are on the right hand side of the curve, we simply adjust the load to to go to the the, the topmost point. And this is how it looks like in, in operation. So you can see a hill type of um, envelope and the red, sorry, the yellow, yellow curve that you can see is the, the real, um, real time power that's basically um, tracking over um, to go towards the maximum power. And this is how it looks like uh, mathematically. So I, I observed the um, power coming off these fuel cells. For the first 20 days within the, um, within the um, starter, so, so within the inoculation, um, I, see, I start seeing some potential development from these fuel cells. Um, so you can see the power generation was starting up already with MPPT, but no power generation from the constant load, loading fuel cells. And as I, as I um, continue to observe, um, the constantly loaded, um, constant loaded um, fuel cell produced and started producing power at 40 days. So the power generation or the startup almost halved by using these MPPTs for startup, starting up. We do use them for real-time PowerPoint. Um, um, so basically to, to harvest the maximum power from photovoltaic cells and many other, um, you know, the conventional fuel cells as well. Um, but I, this is the first time I use them to, to start these fuel cells up. So really, using these um, MPPTs, we could have, um, have the, the starting up, which was a good news. And if we look at the power generation as well, we can see that the MPPT must have enhanced the selection of bacteria so that the power generation from those were quite high compared to the um, uh, non-MPPT, uh, which is the red one that you can see on the slide. And if you if you observe the um, the um, oxidation peaks using these um, from generated from these fuel cells, you can see that the um, constant loaded uh, MFC um, fuel cell generated. Uh, or the other way around, MPPT gen um, uh, loaded MFC generated almost three and a half times the oxidation peak gen that was generated through the constant loaded MFC. So here I would like to pose and ask a question to, to our listeners. 
how much do you think the potential is generated by typical microbial fuel cells? So here I should be clear that the potential, by, by potential, I mean open circuit potential. Is it one and a half volts, 3.7 volts, 0.9 volts, or 1.1 volts? Okay, whilst you think about those and, and provide your answer, we collect those. I would just briefly um, look at the contents and come back to the context. Why and what we are, um, why we are interested in this potential. Okay, so for electricity production, it's no good if we can only generate 0.1 volt, for example. We, we can't really use them for practical reasons. We need to stack them up. You know, we, we need to, you know, most devices we, um, they use around three volts at least, 3.5, um, and then higher up DC volts, five volts, 12 volts, and even higher than those. Um, so less than one volt, for example, is not really practical, um, to use. So we need to naturally stack them up, you know, stack these cells to, to get some practical, uh, voltage generation and then further scale them up so that we can deal with the, the the high throughput that's required by the wastewater industry, for example. Okay, so I, I hope you have um, selected your answer already for the potential generated by fuel cells. So let's go over to the to the stack voltage control. So when we stack them up, we naturally connect them, you know, positive to negative, um, and so on, and provide a, a load overall. It's similar to the the batteries that we normally connect um, in in some of our household devices. So in this experiment, I also connected um, uh, a, a dummy loads um, to these individual cells before connecting them into series. And you will see why, why I connected them like that. And then um, also replace those dummy static loads with uh, MPPT, my, um, maximum power point tracking. Okay, so um, the, the reason for, for this is that under the serial hydraulic, when, when they are all fed with um, water, wastewater, there are few situations where um, one of the cells might not be fed very well. It might be clogged up or um, it's just too much further down the line that it, it's, it doesn't have the same operating conditions as the other two or other, other cells in the stack. So there are different operating conditions sometimes. And they might, that might cause some imbalance in the, in the, in the voltage generation. So to, to create this imbalance, I underfed, underfed one of the fuel cells. And the results I got was if I operated them in the normal stack, you can see that the um, voltage from one of the uh, one or two of the fuel cells were reversed, so they they didn't have enough energy um, to produce um, the voltage enough um, big enough to match the other cells, and they underwent the reversal of voltage. So the green line is the one that you can see is the stack voltage, which is lower than any single cells. And it's very impractical to use this. So then I connected these um, cells with MPPTs um, in parallel to each cell, just to just to control each um, voltages, each cell's voltages, and um, then connected them in series. And you can see the result quite the result is quite evident that no cells underwent um, voltage reversal. The power generation is quite varied here as well. So if in case we need to match the voltages, 
this is where we would need to control voltage, individual cell voltages. And that's where we come to um, come to looking at um, controlling individual voltages. Now, to control these cells individually, we need to know their behaviors. And that's where I started looking at these um, uh, the input-output relationships. And this is generally um, dealt with in, in, in the study of um, identification of systems, so system identification. Um, I would just like to um, mention here that the, the left picture, the left schematic um, that you can see, the G of S represents the dynamics of the system. Um, and here, in our case, is the fuel cell dynamics. So to determine those dynamics, I um, subjected those fuel cells to um, uh, some perturbation that was very, um, very small in terms of the, uh, the level from one to the other. Um, but I provided random um, signal here in this case, pseudo random binary signal that was um, provided just to um, just to provide some noise to the system or the variability in the the disturbance that the system will see just to excite that um, system through different frequencies and so on um, and and observe the output so just to simply get the input and output relationship from these cells. And the disturbance was done through the external loading uh, in terms of 50 ohms. Um, that was quite small compared to its operation, uh, operational um, uh, uh, loading. So um, the picture on the top right shows the step, various step responses. Um, and I think that that is quite self-evident that um, shows the different steps that were considered for entire operational range. Okay, so what I observed was non-linearity. So what I mean by that is if the, um, the system was operated at lower loading condition, the time constants were low, and if the system was operated at higher loading loading condition, the time constants were were quite high. And these time constants, by the way, were um, considered using first order system within the um, within the systems um, uh, systems engineering. Um, so first order systems are basically um, First order differential equation um, that that generates this dynamics. So just to briefly catch the idea, when we operate the system at lower lo lower end of the loading, what we observe is the system gives um, a fast dynamics, which means the the output is reached um, to stable level in uh, again you know, um, in, in no time or very, very quickly. But if we operate and if we provide same, same step um, at higher loading, then the system uh, generates the output, which is quite, um, it, it's developed quite slowly. You know, it's, it, it doesn't develop as much faster as the, as the lower loading one. So the time constant is the, the one that describes the speed of the response. And this is what you can see here, different speed of the responses. This is quite crucial in, in terms of um, developing a control system because the control system designed for lower loading will not produce um, desirable conditions um, or desirable, desirable performance at higher loading condition. So just to um, briefly mention the analogy with a conical tank, um, if we have a liquid coming into this conical tank, which is in our case, supply of current, 
um, we develop some potential um, in in conical tank. We, it will be height of the water or height of the liquid that's in there. So for the same um, draw of current, if the the uh, it, the draw of current basically is dependent on the height. Yeah. Um, the the height will be um, for for the same draw of current, the height will change quite slowly when we are looking at the top end. And as the the, the liquid starts depleting in that um, that tank, um, you will see for the same amount of rate of draw, um, the height will change rapidly over time. So um, this is the, the rate of current draw, basically. Um, and of course, we don't have constant supply of current um, in in our fuel cell, um, just to just to briefly mention. Um, and so, what we need to do is linearize these models. So we look at look at small strips of these um, uh, operating conditions, and our model will be um, true for that particular strip. So basically, we'll have different parameters. Um, uh, different parameters for that, that that relate to different operating conditions. And that's what I did there. I briefly, um, just to recap, um, I, I had done different um, uh, loading conditions and different, um, uh, so I, I determined different time constants for those um, conditions. And I used those to um, uh, to um, uh, tune my uh, PID controller, basically. So the the gains for those controllers will be um, um, uh, adjusted according to the operating condition that we have. And this is what we see from the um, step um, step uh, tests. Here I should mention that the lower end, we can see the oscillations that was caused by the um, um, the, rain, the, the digital potentiometer that I was using. But nevertheless, it was satisfactorily um, able to control all different ranges of voltages that, that we had. Okay, so... Um, Ten minutes, sir, it's us. Thank you very much. So I, I just want to um, um, briefly mention the the, um, the results from um, the question that we posed, and most of us think that uh, most of you think thought that the potential observed by uh, potential generated by MFCs um, is 0.9 voltage, which is correct, 0.9 volts. So. Um, uh, Thanks very much for um, uh, confirming that as well. Okay, so um, just to extend this control, um, what I wanted to show here is that the variation variation by temperature, variation caused by temperature and um, depletion of fuel was um, uh, that that those were basically disturbances caused to the um, fuel cell, and we could see that the controller was able to um, maintain that those voltages. Okay, so that now now we can control different voltages. We can simply scale them up as well and and put them into stack. Okay, so this is where um, I briefly wanted to show. Um, um, different systems uh, developed by different researchers across the world. Um, there have been several different um, uh, capacities of um, liquid and the power produced from those. And the one thing that I would like to stress here is that the scale-up is quite um, adversely affected by the volume of um, the fuel cell. If we go to smallest scale, um, 
that's that's where the fuel cell was shown to produce high uh, power density. And as we go up the scale, um, we can uh, the, the power produced by those were diminishing. Okay, so um, this is just to show you um, quite a few different um, laboratory scale um, uh, fuel cells. And um, what what I tried to do here was to optimize so optimize the um, the availability of fuel and taking away the fuel um, from the anode without without um, uh, introducing too much separation between these electrodes um, and also without compromising the anode capacity. So this is where I started looking at the multi-physics approach where um, looked at the um, computational fluid dynamics um, along with the mass transport and um, tried to optimize the, um, the, the fuel cell uh, geometry. So here you can see the helical um, uh, electrode, um, which is basically the helical uh, fluid channel. And that's where you can see that as we increase the, the um, increase the flow rate of fuel, um, the, the fluid, we, we start seeing the mixing of this fuel, which is really great because we need to provide um, fuel to the, um, to the bacteria as well as take away the product from the bacteria. Um, so basically, you know, increase the turnover. And this resulted in, in um, you know, by, by using uh, the mixers in the fluid channel, that, that enhanced the, um, the, the su supply and takeaway of the, the products. Um, I think you can see on the rightmost um, image that this is quite self-evident here. And the same thing observed from the power um, they produced in, in lab scale, that um, by providing the um, appropriate mixers, um, we could enhance the, the power production from these fuel cells. So the learning was taken and, and used, um, um, basically they were scaled up um, so here you can see a very small um, uh, one module of these fuel cell where the helical structure is, is where the anode is and, and it's placed in a tubular form um, that can be stacked up easily by just, you know, uh, hydraulically connect them in series. So basically one after the other and that would be um, uh, that would mean we scale up without compromising um, the, the um, without compromising in terms of the electrode separation. Okay, so this is um, this this video shows the electricity generation, and I I think see, seeing is believing. So. Um, what you can see here is bacteria producing electricity directly from uh, decomposition of acetate, and that's driving a small fan in a in a helicopter. It's quite small amount of electricity. I, I um, agree with that, but what we what we can see here is that they produce electricity, which can be very useful. And the thing that I would like to stress here is that the amount of acetate is not really needed. It's it's not even high amount of acetate. It's very small in terms of like one millimolar solution that produces enough electricity already. So this product, this kind of process can be used for water polishing, where end of anaerobic digester, where when we are no longer able to take away um, uh, the um, uh, the contaminants um, um, contaminants very uh, efficiently. Um, this is this process can be employed there, where we can further enhance the polishing. And this is showing the lab scale um, uh, scaling up. 
um, where five of those modules were connected in series in a tube. And you can see that the power generation was about 20 watts per cubic meter from the overall tube. And I'm reaching towards, um, I'm reaching 45 minutes, but if I can take five more minutes, I would like to touch upon the other types of applications as well. Um, so this is really showing the scaled up version of that um, fuel cell reaching up to 10 liters um, at lab scale. And really showing some power produced from that. Um, you can see that each of those tubes were producing um, it, depending on where they are, where the fuel cells are, um, they produce, you know, higher or lower power from those um, cells. And the trends were quite similar in terms of hydraulically uh, series connections. Nevertheless, they all produce ele um, electricity. In terms of using those same, using the power from um, those fuel cells in terms of producing hydrogen. Um, that's where I started um, putting those same tubes of fuel cells into electro, um, in, in terms of um, electrosynthesis um, type of fuel cell, um, sorry, electrosynthesis cells, where the um, electrodes were supplied with the uh, extra voltage um, that you can see in red text, 0.85 volts. Okay, so for hydrogen production, we know that electrodes, they need to uh, be uh, supplied with two, two and a half volts. And here I only provided 0.85 volts. So this is lower voltage required compared to the conventional electrolysis. And um, what I observed was it was producing more than half liter of hydrogen per day per liter of anode volume and and here you can see um, hydrogen production in action you can see a bubble forming on 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 top of the electrode and that was really 100 percent hydrogen and if you think that the um uh, the bubble was coming from the the anode chamber um, I just adjusted my uh, camera to just show you really that the the electrode was was not directly on top of the membrane, um, so there is no water, so there is no air coming through the membrane. It's simply the production of hydrogen directly on that on, on that electrode. In terms of biosensing. Now, because these cells, you know, they, these fuel cells, they react to the, um, the supply fuel directly, we can use the voltages produced by those fuel cells as a kind of signal to say that, okay, I've got, you know, some concentration of contaminant in water. So they can be readily used as biosensing. And the idea here would be to scale down instead of scaling up to to produce um, um, enough to, to have enough sensitivity in in the sensing and enough range of um, sensing as well. So here you can see in pictures um, uh, a prototype of those uh, biosensors that was um, done under a project in, um, funded by Innovate UK along with. Um, um, the Newcastle University and, and an, in, an industrial partner. In terms of recovering metal in, in, um, uh, present in the uh, wastewater, we can do that as well, similarly to um, hydrogen production. And here you can see that um, copper was recovered from, from water um, in this type of arrangement. So where do we go from here? Um, it might be cliche to say that the population is on the rise and 
but but it's a fact. It's a fact that the population is already um, uh, on on the rise. Uh, it's it 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 is stabilizing to another level. Nevertheless, we do have energy intensive processes. We all use waste. Uh, we all use water for our daily activities, and and we never consider where it goes and how um, it needs to be treated um, uh, to to uh, take away the pollution um, in in the water. So by employing some of these technologies, which are energy less intensive, um, we can really um, get the energy and resources back from water um, and to, to uh, provide more sustainable means of um, uh, um, treating our wastewater. Um, and of course, we can use the same process to produce power in remote areas as well, where there is no um, direct um, means of um, providing electricity or there is um, scarcity of energy uh, in terms of uh, prioritizing the energy use. So I think the, um, the horizon is quite promising um, with this type of technology, but we do have some um, more research to um, uh, to undertake to basically um, provide more uh, low cost and very effective um, technology for for this type of application. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for listening. And I would like to thank um, iMakey team as well for providing me the, uh, the platform to um, disseminate some of the interesting work. So with that, I would like to um, invite any questions you, you may have. So thanks very much. Thank you, Hitesh. Um, that was uh, really fascinating. Um, I didn't know much um, about um, um, biological cells at all. So that was um, and, uh, quite good to see a little bit on, on the applications. Um, yeah, we, we have got some questions. Um, Firstly, from Man Jun, um, a lecturer at Curtin University, um, what are the challenges and opportunities of using biological fuel cells? That's a great question. Um, thanks very much. Um, in terms of challenges, um, because these are biological fuel cells, the um, uh, Competition within where the operating where they are operating. For example, we feed wastewater, which does contain other bacteria as well, and they do have their own processes. For example, production of methane, production of hydrogen sulfide, or any other compounds. So um, they do have competition in terms of resources. Um, so that you know, um, how do we? maximize the electricity production and minimize the production of gases, um, unwanted gases, I should say. Um, that's quite a, a challenging process. And there are ways that um, researchers have uh, come up with um, in terms of, um, I, I think I've mentioned a few, um, in terms of acclimatizing um, these fuel cells to specific environmental conditions. Um, providing them um, the loading conditions that match um, the um, the optimum environment for the bacteria, and also some of the um, the design, mechanical design itself, which um, you know puts these bacteria in close proximity um, to the, the the electrodes, and the electrodes themselves are also in close close proximity. So that there is no or less internal resistance for um, the proton exchange and, and electrical um, um, electrical um, circuit. Um, so those are quite the few challenges that we currently have. Um, the other challenge is the scaling up. Um, as we scale up, I mentioned already that. The, the, um, we do have this competition and the production of power um, does diminish. So how do we maintain the power production while, uh, while upscaling? 
is is quite a a, a challenge and opportunities are are of course there um we do have opportunity in terms of wastewater polishing so um what i'm saying is really we're not really replacing um anaerobic digester in in uh, treating wastewater but what i what i'm saying is we have um you know they they do produce some um uh, water that that has uh, still some um compounds left in there so um uh, mainly the um cod's you know chemical oxygen demand um we can turn those uh into electricity um even after even after um they come from anaerobic digester so that's quite um a good opportunity and there are other opportunities that I've I've already um presented in terms of um using them for different kind of um recovery of metals hydrogen production which are now less energy intensive compared to conventional processes thank you um i think you might have covered some of the other questions but um uh, the next one was um um isn't the benefit of producing electricity negated by the production of metha in um environmental damage um could you please um rephrase um, that i i think um i mean obviously methane's given off which is considered a, a sort of a bad for the environment um and i suppose if if you're using this method to produce electricity compared to other uh green methods of producing electricity it, mm. it seems to have a disadvantage <laughs> but um but, yeah i i think i understand the question i i would like to stress here that um electricity produced here are directly coming from the composition of um hydrocarbons so there are no methane produced from this process itself okay. um the conventional uh, anaerobic digester they do produce methane so there is um a, a chain of processes to to go through to produce electricity via um via burning methane um so this process uh, basically bypasses that uh, production of methane so there are no yeah. methane produced um there are no methane produced um only the thing is that we do have competition with methane generating bacteria so there are electrons generating bacteria um researchers call them electrogens as opposed to methanogens which produce uh, methane so so this process um doesn't really produce any methane it's just oh, the okay. um, the, the Yeah. the bacteria that use methane are also present in the same environment um which is why we have methane producing so it actually takes out more or it sort of um yeah the net effect that it's it's better than the 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 ones that are producing the methane <laughs> yes yeah it it it's more environmentally friendly should should we say yeah um the next question was um I think you might have answered this but what is the next step in stepping up the power output of these cells The next step would be to um have an industry relevant um system produced um and demonstrated in in the UK um that really uh, takes the 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 wastewater and generates electricity that's in usable form So I would say something along the lines of um 1000 liter or even more um than that at least at a demo scale demo scale so it should be a self sustaining process um that um that is um cost effective in a way that um um the energy produced by these cells um that can be used in terms of pumping water to you know some some height um where these um from from where the water is trickling down through these cells and they produce electricity so in in a way it should be self sustaining 
process rather than us inputting extra energy into it. Yeah, yeah, it sounds um, really good. I hope it uh, <laughs> hope it goes goes ahead and um, more research is done. Um, yeah, that's all we have time for really. But um, yeah, thank you again for yeah really um, interesting talk um, and. Um, and everyone, um, we've had a few thanks in the uh, in the Q and A. So everyone's uh, enjoyed it. Um, so um, yeah, with um, with that, I think um, thank everyone for attending, and um, hopefully we'll uh, arrange another another of these sometime. <laughs> so um, yeah. yeah, thanks very much, Atesh, and um, uh, see everyone uh, next time. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks to the iMaking team as well.